Hello and welcome to today's expert panel webinar. And it's on how to ensure success for your transportation IoT project with seamless connectivity. My name is Jeremy Cowan. I'm Editorial Director and Co-Founder of IoT Now, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. Thank you all for joining us. We've got a great discussion for you, brought to you with Sierra Wireless and backed up by independent analysis from Berg Insight. So the first thing to do is to introduce you to our speakers. They are Richard Anderson, Senior Analyst at Berg Insight, who will speak first. Uh, we've worked together on many reports, and it's great to have you here on this webinar, Richard. Thank you. It's good to be here, Jeremy. And I'm delighted to welcome back a speaker we've all enjoyed here before, Cyril Hulin, who is Vice President of Product Marketing for Sierra Wireless's Cloud and Connectivity Services. Great to have you back, Cyril. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, today we're looking at how to create seamless connectivity for your business-critical uh, moving assets. We all know that when you implement IoT, you need to be able to detect all available networks and to do so seamlessly. And then you need to be able to select the best for that location and connect to the carrier. Well, our guests are here to tell you how. This webinar is being recorded, and you can access it again from tomorrow via our website at iot-now.com. We also want to know what you think, and we've allowed time later for your questions. So do start sending them to me right now and after their presentations, I'll put your questions to our panel. All you have to do is click on the questions button and type your query into the window. Of course, any that we don't get to will be passed to our speakers to answer offline. Finally, if, you have, if you're having any technical issues with audio or slides, you can also use the question window to get advice from our excellent tech support team. Before we go any further, however, we have a question for you in our audience poll. As you can see, we want to know at what stage is your IoT deployment? I'd just ask you, if you would, to click on whichever answer is closest to your experience. Is it A, B, C, or D? And we'll see the results in a moment. Don't forget, the answers are, of course, anonymous. So at what stage is your IoT deployment? Is it A, I'm already using connected devices? B, I already have an IoT project underway? C, I plan to start an IoT project in the next 12 months? Or D, I am doing research and not yet sure about an IoT project. Well, that should give us time to find out what you've been thinking. And that is uh, an interesting thing. We've got a tie for the first. Um, the largest number, at just under 39%, is equal amount for I am already using connected devices. And for those who are at the other end of the spectrum, I'm doing research and not yet sure about an IoT project. So, um, Cyril, is that the kind of figure that you expected to see? Well, y y yes and no. I, I think it, it shows the reality of the market. It, first, it reflects the, the maturity uh, we, we see from our customers or our, our prospect, generally speaking. We're still pretty much in the inflection point of the of this industry of this transformational uh, area of our industry uh, uh, between some 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 segments some maturing fast maturing uh, areas of the market and also and many many nascent projects uh, uh, also in in, in, in various um, segments of the of the industry. So, in, still in the inflection point region of the of the um, 
of IoT. There's clearly a healthy number at uh, nearly 17% already saying that they plan to start an IoT project in the next 12 months. Um, Richard, did this sort of meet your expectations? Well, uh, I would say that this adds up quite well with my experience from the space, uh, especially from a fleet management perspective where the penetration it is uh, high, but it's not super high, and a lot of companies have uh, projects in the pipe. Okay. Um, well, look, let's crack on with the webinar itself now, um, starting, as I said earlier, with Richard, Richard Anderson uh, of Berg Insight. And afterwards, Richard will hand over directly to Cyril. So um, over to you, Richard. Thank you. So I'm Richard, and I work for Berg Insight. Just a few short words about the company I work for. We're an analyst firm based in Sweden, specialized in M2M and the Internet of Things, covering all the major verticals. My main research area is fleet and asset management and telematics, and we also have people covering, for example, smart metering, smart homes, and uh, mobile health, just to name a few. And apart from off-the-shelf reports, we also do quite a lot of bespoke research assignments for clients in our focus markets. Here we have the agenda for my part of the session today. First, I will chat some light on the types of the global fleet and asset management market for a number of transportation-related asset types. Then we'll have a look at the largest solution providers serving this space. And lastly, I will highlight a number of key trends taking place in the market. And this presentation is actually, to some extent, a condensed version of our most recent analyst report on transport and telematics which is featured in the new edition of IoT Now. So if there's something you want to know more about, you, you know where to find it. Okay, well, let's get started. In a transport context, the broader fleet and asset management market includes telematics and tracking systems deployed for monitoring and management of different types of commercial motor vehicles, as well as trailers, containers, and other transportation-related assets. That, for example, includes air freight cargo containers and other logistics units such as individual pallets or even cargo boxes. Uh, the global market is forecasted to increase from around 40 million active systems in 2016 to reach almost 100 million in 2021. And as you can see, fleet management for commercial vehicles is clearly the largest segment, followed by trailers and then containers. Containers, however, represent a very promising emerging segment, which is forecasted to outpace both commercial vehicles and trailers in terms of growth in the coming years. If we have a look at the solution providers serving this space, it should first be noted that there are hundreds of fleet telematics players worldwide. And most of them are, however, small and quite local, but some of them have grown to become very large and highly international. Uh, so today, uh, the top 10 providers globally together have a total active installed base of more than 7 million units. Notably, Verizon has in the past year become the largest provider as a direct effect of an aggressive acquisition strategy in the space, acquiring Fleetmatics, which was formerly the leader on its own, as well as Telogius, which was also a top 10 player. And other major uh, players today include the software provider Gurtam from Belarus, the US-based pioneer Omnitrax, uh, the major location-based solution provider Trimble, and the European market leader TomTom Tom Telematics. And these providers all have over 700,000 subscriptions, and there's, as you can see, a few more that have surpassed half a million units worldwide as well. Uh, Omnitrax is, by the way, a leading provider not only for commercial trucks, but also one of the top players for trailers, and to some extent intermodal containers used in uh, transportation. Moving on to the key trends we have identified in this market. First, it's apparent that not only aftermarket telematics players are active in the fleet management space, also vehicle OEMs across many regions have entered the market in various ways. And historically, well-known OEM telematics systems such as Scania Fleet Management, Daimler's Fleet Board, and Volvo's Dynafleet, they have largely been developed in-house. But over time, we have, however, seen many vehicle OEMs teaming up with leading aftermarket providers to launch branded systems. Uh, one of the most known examples of this would probably be Ford Telematics, powered by Telogius, which I have chosen to kind of illustrate this trend. 
And uh, we predict that the partner strategy will continue to grow in popularity among the commercial vehicle OEMs across all markets at the expense of in-house development efforts. Then we have the consolidation trend, which we have already touched upon a bit with Verizon's acquisition of both Telodius and Fleetmatics in 2016. And the pace of M&A activity has in general been quite intense, and the ongoing consolidation in this space is expected to continue in the coming years with additional blockbuster transactions as well as smaller strategic deals foreseen in the near term. And as we saw earlier, numerous providers today have more than half a million active subscribers globally, and the milestone of one million subscriptions has now been surpassed in the past year. Um, this is clearly driven by growth strategies combining aggressive M&A activity with high pace organic growth. And in line with a long-term prediction that we set out already a few years back, Bergen Site has confidently uh, anticipated, and, and here I quote myself, a future scenario where the global fleet management market is dominated by a handful of providers with installed bases measured in the millions. Well, fast forward to 2017, and it's now clear that this prophecy is well on its way to be fulfilled. Moving on to the next set of trends. A major technology trend is the shift in the telematics hardware footprint towards mobile solutions. And countless solution providers have integrated both ruddedized and consumer-grade smartphones and tablets as in-cab options and complementary access interfaces for both low- and high-end fleet management systems. Uh, simply put, it's become possible to deploy advanced software on an increasing variety of standard devices, leading to a general commoditization of telematics hardware. And as an alternative to hardwired black box systems, there are on the other end of the spectrum fully app-based offerings, and in between there are solutions based on connecting low-cost dongle-like devices, which interface with the vehicle, but use the handset's communication capabilities. And uh, highly related to this development is the inflow of new contenders aiming to capitalize on the electronic logging device mandate, or ELD mandate for short, in the U.S., offering different types of electronic logging solutions in line with the regulatory developments around hours of service monitoring aimed at replacing paper-based logs. And several players have started out with fully app-based logging solutions and later introduced associated optional hardware to ensure compliance with the current rules and the coming ELD regulations when enforced, meaning low-cost devices that connect the ECM of the vehicle. Uh, one example is Big Road. They were acquired by Fleet Complete in March, by the way, uh, which offers a solution uh, based on this model. And aside from form factor developments, video-based solutions are further a hot topic for various types of vehicles, including trucks, buses, and construction equipment. And cameras can be installed for many different purposes, ranging from basic dash cam applications to systems enabling a 360-degree view of the exterior of the vehicle. And uh, video-based driver risk management solutions can also take advantage of driver-facing cameras, which can be used for post-drive coaching. And there are also solutions that include elements of direct driver feedback in the cab. And some advanced video-based solutions even leverage continuous eye and facial tracking, to detect and prevent driver fatigue and distraction in real time using sophisticated algorithms. And the last trend I'll highlight is related to a type of diversification among providers of fleet management solutions for commercial vehicles to also support other types of assets. Uh, this development is by some dubbed as the Internet of Transportation Things, and in essence it means that several solution providers now offer integrated solutions that can be deployed across different off-highway vehicles non-powered assets, and other non-vehicle fleets, in addition to the com conventional commercial vehicle types that are traditionally targeted by these providers. And not only does this make it possible for fleet owners to monitor and manage all of their business-critical assets on the same platform, but it also enables fleet telematics providers to maintain subscriber growth as mature markets eventually approach peak penetration, at least in the traditional segments where the industry started out. Therefore, this opens up a heavily underpenetrated market with considerable potential for telematics providers that are ready to diversify the product offering. To conclude, the commercial telematics market is impacted by a number of trends, including several developments that can alter the market conditions for solution providers and associated players in the future. 
multiple parallel market and technology shifts that are currently transforming the industry may in the longer term create a playing field characterized by a new type of market dynamics. Uh, the market is in, is in the coming years expected to continue along a consistent growth trajectory, which has more or less prevailed throughout the past decade, largely driven by international telematics giants offering increasingly advanced solutions to customers of all shapes and sizes. Uh, the market is at the same time gradually extending as new and improved functionality is implemented on a wide scale across an ever-increasing range of asset types. Thank you for listening to my part of today's session. Uh, here are my contact details if you want to get in touch with us. Now over to you, Cyril. Thank you, Ricard. Thank you very much. So in, in my presentation, I will mainly address how EUICC or eSIM will transform the connected transportation project. So to start with, I, I will first dive into a, a quick introduction of Sierra Wireless. Sierra is, is a pure player, Internet of Things, or a ran to m solution provider with three areas of expertise. Uh, first, uh, which is its historical business, IoT, cellular connectivity modules and modems, so, so low-level hardware. Secondly, uh, wireless gateways and routers. Uh, and thirdly, which is the, uh, the most recent business and, and growth area of Sierra, is connected device services from device management global cellular connectivity, uh, business data, uh, analytics, and, and application enablement. Uh, so Sierra Wireless turned over in 2016 about $600, $615 million, shipping more than uh, 15 million modules worldwide. Uh, for, since uh, the, 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 uh, the birth of this industry, Sierra has shipped about uh, more than 100 million modules, and it anticipates to ship another 140 million modules by 2021. So it's a, a massive, massive share, and, and Sierra owns about 35% of, uh, of global market share for this industry. Uh, a, a bit more details about uh, our positioning in the, in the services space. So Sierra is not only a provider for modules, but also for IoT cloud and connectivity services. Um, we have more than 2 million subscribers and 1,000 customers worldwide on our platform. This gives us scale to deliver globally to small customers all the way up to, to large OEMs and, and among, among others, big names in the, in the auto, automotive space. Sierra Wireless is focused on providing flexibility to our customers and making it simple for them to access the best connectivity anywhere across the globe based on the needs uh, for any type of IoT use case. Our vision is to remove barriers and complexity for customers by taking the complexity out of connectivity and enabling the possibility to uh, count less new business models and applications. And that's, that's getting more and more complex every day. Now, we, if we try to address the, uh, the, the, the key challenges of our, of our industry, uh, why did we build up this solution portfolio? We made the observation over time uh, that most IoT developments and most of our customers were facing the following challenges and were asking themselves, first, how do I maximize my coverage for my deployments uh, from single country to regional to global uh, deployments? Uh, how do I face the challenges of rural or rural de deployments, uh, urban canyons, indoors, outdoors, deep indoors? These are uh, obvious challenges that most of our customers face. Secondly, how do I maximize the QoS of my connected solution uh, or, or service? Um, service, connectivity, uptime rate, end-to-end -end resilience. Then how do I cope with my solution's complex life cycle from technology conti continuity risks, the sunset of, uh, of 2G, 3G uh, uh, technologies? How do I simplify and short-term my time to market? How do I de-risk my deployment? How do I avoid uh, eventual, eventual uh, MNO uh, lifetime lock-in? And then in terms of simplification, how do I simplify my logistics, SIM and device logistics, my operations, uh, and eventually, um, more in more and more cases, my multi-country or, or global deployment? So, so these are the the four major challenges 
which most of our customers face and which we try to massively simplify and, and de-risk. So then I, I will uh, try to address these, uh, these issues at the light of a certain number of uh, automotive use cases and especially uh, car sharing, the, the, the car sharing applications, which is a, a clear disruption in the automotive industry. Uh, it's, it's now becoming a, 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 sh a shift in the way we consume transportation and, and, and cars. It's a, a, a viable alternative to traditional car, car ownership. Um, it's a way to provide maximum convenience for customers, uh, pay per use, basically uh, consumption of, uh, of, uh, of transportation. And the latest trend for, uh, in, the, in the car sharing applications is what we call free floating. Uh, so it's the most advanced car sharing model, which requires connectivity anywhere the customer can leave the car. So it's basically uh, the fact of uh, uh, letting the, uh, the, the, the end user drop the car when he, wherever he wants, uh, and not only in, a, in, in a dedicated, dedicated stations. So I, I would pro propose to walk through a certain number of, of use cases and examples from our customers. Uh, and those, customer, those, those use cases, in many cases, um, require very high level of QoS requirements from coverage to uptime rates. Um, in most cases, uh, urban, urban deployment. But we, we've seen, especially in France, but also in North America, and in examples I have in mind are in Vancouver or some areas of the U.S., where they need uh, both uh, urban canyons uh, coverage, but also rural coverages with SLAs, uh, often very stringent SLAs between car sharing players and municipalities. Coming up also is the need to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, manage and, and deploy uh, electrical vehicles and, and charging stations, and to manage the mix of reser reservation transactions and charging station management. So this requires maximum QoS and minimum connectivity latency. A first example uh, to illustrate, of, yeah, before diving into an example, uh, um, a, a, uh, Sierra has, uh, has um, wrote a, a dedicated white paper on, on car sharing, which is very interesting, uh, drilling into the, the challenges of this industry and the way IoT overall and, and Sierra's solution can address these, uh, these challenges and, uh, and roadblocks. So I, I invite you to, to read this uh, white paper, which is uh, available for download online. The first example of a, of, of a car sharing deployment is a, a company we are accompanying uh, called Hugo. Uh, it's a scooter sharing uh, company uh, for basically short-term rental of, of scooters, which uh, with the first deployment in Bar Barcelona, it's based on the, the free floating philosophy. You can drop the scooter wherever your ride needs to get you to. It's based on fully pay per use. It needs real time, low latency connections in order to uh, dynamic in, dynamically and in, in a very convenient way uh, unlock, the, uh, unlock the scooter. Uh, make a reservation, lock it, and then uh, drop it whenever you want. You want. It has plans for expansion uh, all over Europe, mainly southern Europe, but also other areas of the globe. Uh, and obviously, the, uh, the, 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 the main challenges it was facing were QS challenges. And before trying the, uh, our end-to-end -end solutions, it had, it had tried, Hugo had tried many other types of providers. Um, but it, uh, it ended up uh, being very satisfied with, uh, with our proposition. Uh, so, so its vision was around uh, any time, uh, real time, low latency connections uh, to connect their scooters for, uh, to charging stations, stations uh, lower down the, the, the theft risks. Uh, and, and address uh, mission critical uh, real time transactional needs and, and also uh, in in many cases and it was the case in Barcelona uh, high SLA expectations from the municipality and penalty regimes from the uh, in the relationships to, to the municipality so it's, it's again a, a need for a always on experience uh, connections between the uh, uh, smartphone app 
and uh, since it's free floating and it's uh, it's uh, electrical um, it's based on electrical scooters a, a risk for fraud and theft which is very high and which also needs to address to be addressed through uh, anti anti theft mechanisms a six, second example is a, a company called Incar Cleverness which is also a European-based company. Uh, it's, uh, it provides uh, an innovative end-to-end -end solution enabling uh, dealerships, manufacturers, uh, also car rental operators and, and leasing, uh, leasing operators uh, to uh, enhance the customer's engagement and improve the profitability by continually uh, listening to, what the, to, the, to the car's behavior uh, and to react upon this behavior, so the the uh, it's a it's a two I would say two faced uh, proposition uh, addressing the needs and proposing value for the for the drivers, but also for car dealers and leasing companies as well as as car rental operators. Uh, it provides business intelligence and and analytics solutions uh, on car behavior data. It can feed uh, CRM with uh, rich data to uh, to enable smart uh, anticipation of the of the end user's needs. It reduces the cost for operations, enables remote maintenance, predictive maintenance um, propositions. It also streamlines operations, manages risks, and reduces frauds for especially for for car rental or fleet management applications. So again, it's a two-sided business model, business model with value for the for the, the driver and value for the uh, for for the uh, the backend operator. The third application, uh, an illustration, is a company, a French company called Plus de Borne, uh, which is a electrical vehicle charging station operator. Uh, they have developed their own charging docks and, and stations. Uh, their goal is to address in a smart way smart grid challenges to drop their, the costs of operating uh, fleets of charging sta stations and uh, to, to, to cover key geographical areas, uh, deploy key ge geographical areas in, in a, at a fast pace and, and on a, in, in an efficient and low-cost manner. So the customers' challenges were they needed to to uh, to to benefit from multi-operator network coverages to keep their services always connected, so uh, improve their uptime rate and coverage capabilities in urban areas and rural areas. They 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 need to not be able to only rely on sig single networks. Secondly, they need to have real time with low latency connectivity to enable diagnostics capabilities and also uh, have uh, uh, um, secured uh, SSL uh, and, and encryption links between the end users' applications and their backend and the charging station. So this, and, uh, this, is, this requires really low latency connections between the, uh, their backend and the, uh, and, and the charging stations. They also need to have uh, connectivity services which support pan-European coverage, since their ambitions are are, are at least pan-European. And they need to have uh, solutions which uh, enable fraud management and uh, and real-time access to their uh, and secured access to their to their charging stations. The perceived benefits their perceived benefits from uh, using Sierra Wireless is that it's a, a global global solution with global coverage. Uh, also proposing support and 24/7 support on the uh, on connectivity device management uh, and troubleshooting on their uh, on their charging stations. It's a very resilient uh, and global solution with with a multi-operator uh, a multi-operator proposition in every country in Europe and across the globe. And actually. Uh, they have uh, observed that we offer 100% of uh, operators in Europe and most operators across the globe. And they have, we propose uh, diagnostics tools and diagnostics dashboards, so they have control to reset the connection anywhere across the globe. And among others, these uh, diagnostics dashboard and the hooks we propose uh, for them to monitor and act on their connections remotely from their 
um, kind of knock dashboards was was very valuable for them. And again, the 24/7 support and high high QoS resilience they have uh, on their connection was a was a clear clear premium for them since uh, they too have in some cases a very stringent and uh, SLA with the, with their customers, which are municipalities or uh, or enterprises. So, uh, how do we? What do we propose to these uh, to these players? Uh, and what type of connectivity connectivity does the industry offer? So, first, uh, uh, when the uh, when IoT and M2M started, uh, it relied on uh, traditional domestic SIMs provided by operators on their uh, domestic markets. That's pretty much the uh, the prehistory of IoT and M2M. Then, and it was a fairly weak proposition, uh, mainly uh, targeting cheap deployments, but largely inefficient in terms of coverage and management tools, especially management tools, uh, which which were a key pain point and head headache uh, for uh, scalability and uh, and and uh, multi-country deployments. Then came the uh, a few years ago roaming teams, uh, which were a, a, a good improvement, providing multi-country coverage. And the capacity to attach to, or at least theoretically attach to multiple networks outside of the uh, the sim's home country. The weakness there is that it's uh, it's very much uh, mobile telephony and voice oriented. Uh, obviously, targeting uh, a traditional roaming sim targets very very voice oriented usages, and also is is built around the logic of roaming alliances. So meaning. Uh, a SIM from MNOX will be able to roam on a certain number of operators uh, outside of it, its home country, depending on the logic of alliances of the uh, of the host MNO of the host uh, operator. So that uh, dramatically diminishes the reality of the, the number of network it has access to compared to the the theoretical coverage of, of a roaming SIM. A second step, uh, in, uh, which was a, a major improvement we brought to that market, is the, uh, the Sierra Smart Team, which we brought to market a few years ago. It's based on, uh, on um, a patented on-seam uh, applet. This is a, a uh, based on the development of a, uh, an embedded smart decision engine in the SIM which enables the uh, smart network attachment selection. So it's uh, uh, designed purely for IoT uh, and will adapt to data-centric applications. It's, it's, it enables truly global coverage with, and opens non-biased access to most operators across the globe. And generally, spe generally speaking, all operators in most countries, so 100% of operators in, in Europe, North America, and in most countries, we have access to all uh, to all three three GPP uh, three GPP operators. It also relies on uh, on a decentralized and autonomous aid, so it, it relies sorry on a de decentralized and autonomous agent agent on the SIM to make sure the device uh, attaches uh, dynamically to the best giving net network at all times according to the business and operational logic of. Uh, of the uh, the fleet of objects which is being uh, deployed, and in most cases, we we try to analyze the uh, the behavior of uh, the expectation of the uh, of the object and and tweak the decision and decision engine so that uh, it adapts to the QS criteria uh, pertinent for that for that deployment. Uh, a bit of details about the how a, a traditional roaming sim will will behave and uh, and the nuances with a a, a, the smart sim. So a, a roaming, a traditional roaming sim uh, at power up will uh, attempt to connect to the first network, uh, which is hard coded in the list of preferred networks. This network uh, list ranks potential visited PLMNs or visited network uh, by the home MNO uh, as they belong to the same network alliances that alliance. And it probably presents the best cost advantage for the MNO. So this is this is a a, uh, a, a clear sorry I went a bit fast. This is a clear weakness from the uh, the uh, a traditional roaming sim 
is that uh, it attaches to uh, a network ranked number one from the list of preferred network and will only eventually attach to another network when network number one drops. On top of that, more and more, we observe another phenomenon which is very important, uh, which, we call, which is called signaling steering. The signaling roaming steering will eventually force the device not to attach to network rank number two or three in the list of preferred networks and stick to net network number one uh, regardless of the availability of data on the network number one uh, for a certain number of attempts before it finally allows the attachment to networks number two and three. And this can take up uh, up to, we've measured it to up to a, a few minutes or even a few tens of minutes before it finally allows the attachment to, a, to a networks number two or three. During this time, obviously, the service is not available and the, the object is not able to attach to, to any network. So this can be, uh, that this can have a very painful side effects on the, connect, on the connected object uh, in terms of uptime rate and, and uh, perception of, uh, of uh, attachment quality. Uh, if we compare that to the uh, smart SIM behavior, the, sm the, uh, the, the, the smart SIM will uh, first uh, scan the network it has in visibility at a given point of time and space, will analyze those different networks and rank them in terms of the QS criteria, and then will automatically select the best giving network at this point of time and space. On top of that, this network selection is completely autonomous and dynamic, which means that if even for a static object, the uh, uh, for a static object, the uh, the uh, the level of, of uh, the, the different QS criteria, Q, uh, the the different uh, QS uh, KPIs change, the the SIM will drive uh, will reselect eventually reselect another network. Whenever, whenever, whenever it, uh, it's judged, judged necessary or, or pertinent. So it's a, a dynamic de decision engine which steers the attachment from any network to any, any network when the, uh, the network conditions and QS conditions evolve. To su so to, to su sum things up, uh, the different uh, value proposition dimensions of the of the Sierra Smart Team are, are the following. First best coverage, network access is not limited to a single roaming alliance, but rather uh, our customers can access every single available 3GPP network across the globe. Secondly, uh, it's quality centric and uh, very resilient service. The network selection is based on the best of all available networks and dynamically autonomously monitors the connection quality. And third, it's carrier agnostic and alliance agnostic uh, by decentralizing the management of the uh, of the Sierra wireless uh, connections, and it also enables uh, the, the platform and the platform enables the management of any third party uh, operator as well, obviously as our SIMs. And this is uh, very important to ease the life and the operational uh, complexity of, uh, of fleet management for for our customers and our OEM. So. A, a customer coming uh, and coming to see us with a, a legacy operation with uh, teams from MNO ABCD will be able to streamline its operations and manage on the same platform with the same set of APIs, uh, teams from uh, any operator and uh, and our teams. And as we as we'll see, also uh, EYCC. So now now if we if we dive into the specificities of, of EYCC, that's the uh, the one step further, the latest and most sophisticated stage of the of the rocket, is the 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 the, uh, the flexibility value EUICC brings to the to our ecosystem and uh, and on our markets. So what is EUICC? Uh, EUICC first is not a form factor. Uh, so some of you probably have have heard about EUICC referred to as eSIM. Uh, so e, uh, let's use EUICC and, and eSIM as a synonym. Uh, so EUICC or eSIM is not a form factor. It can take the, take the shape of a plastic uh, FF, 2FF, 3FF, 4FF SIM, 
or an embedded soldered MFF team. But it's a sort of container, uh, physical container, in which we can load and, and jog play with multiple logical scene profiles. Uh, and this with a, a simple set of APIs uh, like add, remove, activate, deactivate, we can remotely, uh, the fleet management can remotely uh, activate, load, remove logical team profiles on his sim. And therefore, over time, the sim, uh, which then belongs to the OEM and does not anymore belong to the MNO, can remotely be uh, reprovisioned to activate the SIM profile of uh, CR Wireless or essentially any MNO across the globe. So it, it, it brings a totally new uh, level of flexibility to uh, OEMs to, uh, to empower themselves to uh, drive which MNO they load on their device remotely and, and, and in, a, in, a very, uh, uh, in, in a very flexible and risk-free manner. So if we get into the details of how this operates, we, we, we have identified three main uh, families of, uh, of use cases uh, in, in the way EUACCs make sense. Um, so today using an, an eSIM or, or an EUACC is, is, is more, more expensive and clearly more complex than, than, than a traditional SIM. But we, we still see uh, a certain number of use cases where a clear ROI for launching the EYCC makes sense. Uh, these three uh, use cases driving its adoption are first uh, one we call bootstrap. Uh, it's originated from the uh, auto manufacturers uh, to apl and, and applies uh, to many other types of, uh, of producers and, and global OEMs. When creating the connected car, uh, the car makers need uh, a single team which can be shipped and deployed anywhere across the globe on all of their markets to simplify their production and logistics. So a single SKU deployed anywhere across the globe. When the device arrives at its destination and the eSIM is activated, it can be configured with the best subscription based on the region or country where it's deployed. Uh, and according to the, to the customer's preferences or eventually to local regulation. So this approach ensures to have the best service uh, in each area at local rates, matching local, local regulation, while, uh, while meeting any, uh, any local constraints. It's basically a, a native global, so the, the bootstrap um, use case is basically a native global subscription to enable the SIM to, to be accessible at all times. The second use case, which we call the insurance use case, is driven by companies which put equipment on the field and much, <clears throat> sorry, not, not, must operate it for a very long period of time, like smart meters, smart grid uh, devices, for example, uh, or other uh, remote monitoring devices. They may, they, which may be on the field for 10, 20, 25 years without any uh, easy access, physical access to those devices to eventually swap the, the SIM on site. For many reasons, uh, there are great benefits with the ability to potentially change the, scripture, the subscription remotely, to take advantage of new better rates to, uh, while not getting on site, while, while avoiding any truck roll. Uh, to, to eventually also match local regulation uh, and, and in some cases ensure technology continuity. We've seen that uh, in a certain number of countries, it has happened, happened recently in the US, uh, some operators have abandoned their 2G networks, so which, is, which has uh, made, uh, which um, uh, bottom line has been a, a tremendous, tremendous headache for, uh, for large OEMs. So having the capacity to overnight swap the active MNO over one fleet is a, is a major uh, uh, mitigation, uh, risk mitigation um, uh, capability. The third use case, uh, which we call active management or dynamic management, is a more transactional case 
for which there is value in frequently switching the active sub subscription by applying business rules to change dynamically the subscription in use to optimize costs or uh, streamline operations. Uh, we, we actively uh, tune the seller connection to increase the efficiency and service quality or eventually uh, lower costs by automatically downloading a, a more pertinent subscription at the point of time and space. An example is high bandwidth mobile applications like uh, intercity transit buses uh, offering Wi-Fi uh, or international transportation companies or bus, even buses uh, where employees uh, who use portable devices for their travel. So we can eventually uh, dynamically swap the active subscription to have the, the most cost e efficient broadband subscription uh, when landing in a, in a given country. country. I will now give a, a, um, a cinematic example of how EYCC works on the field, what it means uh, concretely. So in this example, operator A could be the, the bootstrap profile uh, loaded onto a seam uh, when shipped uh, on the field by, by a car maker. And the, the, the seam is, is the, the, the car is shipped and is bound to be used, let's say, in, in Brazil, where local regulation imposes a local, local subscription. So we will w wish to uh, swap the uh, bootstrap global profile of uh, provided by operator A, which can be a Sierra's profile or any MNO's profile, swap it by operator B, a local Brazilian operator's profile. So we see that the uh, we, we uh, dynamically uh, over the air load the SIM profile of, of, of operator B, deactivate the profile of operator E, and activate the profile of, of operator B, and uh, therefore the SIM which physically was a uh, uh, mimicking the SIM of uh, operator A, remotely becomes a SIM uh, providing subscription from operator B. Now this is great, but it's very complex. It's, uh, it's very complex and it's, uh, it requires uh, uh, complex integrations and uh, a lot of testing. So um, uh, the uh, embedded SIM or UACC solution uh, has has a, a very promising future. Uh, brings a lot of value to the to the market, but it's both technically and logistically speaking complex and uh, and, and requires the intervention of, of many uh, um, many uh, providers, uh, from modules to SIM card vendors to platform vendors and subscription management systems, uh, which which can eventually be provided by five different. Uh, vendors and providers, uh, plus uh, obviously the MNOs uh, this is from which uh, the, the subscriptions need to be eventually loaded onto the scene. So while the standards are designed to enable interoperability, the reality is that this is the, the this testing uh, will fall on the customer's shoulders, and re it requires complex and very important integrations and and, and testing phases between the uh, the different segments of the, of, the, of the technical production chain. In that scope, Sierra uh, has a unique position and controls three critical components of, the, of this uh, technical production chain, the modules, the SIM cards, and the, the, the remote provisioning and subscription management services, and eventually uh, a connectivity profile enabling global connectivity uh, in an EYCC fashion. So these must work together, be pre-integrated and pre-tested. And this is what Sierra proposes to the market. Our solution is fully GSMA version 3.1, 3.2 compliant. It is fully integrated into AirVantage, our platform, both for uh, profile management or SIM management, managing uh, SIMs from third parties and, uh, and our SIMs, managing the subscription management capabilities uh, of, of EUACC 3.1 uh, profiles and pre-integrating device management uh, for Sierra modules, but also third-party modules. So it's a, we, we provide the capacity to dramatically improve the time to market for our customers and de-risk the, the, uh, the complexities 
of, of, of end-to-end -end integrations and end-to-end -end testing. To lead to my conclusion, um, uh, here is a slide which sums up the, uh, the propositions from uh, different types of, uh, of SIMs and, uh, and connectivity providers. The traditional SIM, the traditional roaming SIM proposes a, to some extent, a global coverage. The smart SIM will provide a, a very critical increment of uh, QS uh, proposition with a multi-operator coverage in, in every country, uh, ensuring best-in-class QS, especially for data-centric applications, a very end-to-end uh, resilient uh, capability with a, a, a centralized uh, SIM management platform, including the, manag the management capability for third-party uh, SIMs. And um, the, 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 the last um, flavor of the technology, EYCC 3. GSMA 3.1 version, which provides on top of that uh, a, a very, very valuable uh, flexibility and, and uh, the capacity to de-risk global uh, deployments of, um, of um, multiple uh, team profiles. Before concluding, uh, we, Sierra has, uh, has uh, written a certain number of white papers uh, on the UACC on transportation and a certain number of, of verticals which are very interesting to uh, assess to the, uh, the, the shape of the market, the size of the market, the, the situation of these different segments, and also illustrate uh, te technological deployments with some, with some customer use cases. So I invite you to download, uh, to download these, these, uh, these uh, white papers um, and uh, which, which can illustrate some important uh, challenges and, and, and roadblocks which many of you can face. And to conclude, I, I also invite you to attend our yearly innovation summit, which will take place in a few weeks' time on the 12th and 30th, 30th of, uh, of June. It takes place once a year in Paris. It's the, uh, the, the meeting point where we showcase our latest innovations uh, the first day is a hackathon uh, gathering uh, developers uh, from uh, from across the globe on site and remotely and on the, on the second day we have uh, demonstrations and plenary sessions we, where we have Sierra uh, speakers and third party speakers uh, addressing key technology trends and market trends uh, and and a certain a number of panels where uh, Sierra and, um, and, uh, and key uh, technology evangelists will, uh, will highlight the, uh, the, the big trends of the industry. And we also have a certain number of customers and partners uh, taking part of this, uh, of this day of uh, demonstrations and, and keynotes. So that will be it for my presentation. I guess we will now head to the, uh, the Q&A session and, uh, and, and sharing about your, your different questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cyril, and thank you, Ricard, as well. Uh, well, that certainly gives us plenty to think about, and already I can see that we've had um, a really good number of questions in, and more are arriving all the time. Keep your questions coming, please. Um, just as an advisory, we won't be sending out the slides, but you can, of course, see them when you stream the webinar, which will be available on our website from tomorrow, and I'll give the web address again at the end, so have a pen handy. Um, the questions, the first question I wanted to ask, which is from a, a consulting company, is really for you, Cyril. Um, is Sierra Wireless's smart SIM based on a proprietary solution to handle migrations from one PLMN to another, or is it based on GSMA's remote SIM provisioning definition? Okay, it's a good question and complex questions. Question: The smart SIM dimension is based on proprietary technology, patented technology. It's a, 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 decision, a piece of code embedded into the SIM, 
which enables the sim to dynamically drive the way the modem will will select the network it attaches to so it's a, it's a, it's a, our sim profile based on our technology and our developments but it can it can adapt to pretty much any modem across the globe to the extent that this modem is compliant with a uh, with standards gsma standards and uh, and um, and uh, and best practices so it's a it's a proper <coughs> proprietary uh, team uh, behavior, I, w I would say, but which adapts to uh, to pretty much any type of uh, deployment and any, any uh, device uh, operated by, by our customers. Now, the embedding this uh, this smart team profile into the EUICC uh, uh, logic of philosophy, uh, then is is fully. Uh, this is something which is fully. Uh, uh, interoperable and standardized. Uh, we and actually we are pro probably one of the very first industry players providing EUACC 3.1, 3.2 versions of the uh, of the standard, which is the first uh, version of the EUACC flavor, which enables complete interoperability between sim vendors, between subscription management providers, meaning uh, uh, mixing and matching. Uh, SMDP, subscription management, data uh, preparation, node, SMSR, so subscription management, secure router, node, and, and, and SIM, uh, SIM vendor, uh, and ensuring interoperability, interoperability between all of these uh, uh, elements. So the, 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 we, we truly believe that EUSCC can only take off with finally this mature uh, version of the, of the standard. We have actually been uh, deploying uh, years ago, I would say pre-standard version of the UACC 2.0, uh, 1.0 and 2.0 versions of the UACC, which uh, lacked maturity in terms of standardization and, and interoperability, and which were are the reason why UACC until now has been a failure. Um, just to, to remind everyone, UACC has been a something uh, on the market for about seven years now, but uh, has not delivered the ex its expectation until now uh, for mainly for poor interoperability reason. But now we we know it's been tested, it's been uh, uh, that the, the maturity of 3.1, 3.2 versions of the standard at last deliver the, uh, the interoperability expectation. And we are pushing very hard for it to become a a, um, a, a vastly adopted uh, technology. Okay, um, we're running very tight for time, um, so I'm going to have to ask both you and uh, Ricard Cyril if you would to keep your answers to 30 seconds, so we can get a few more questions in. What's um, here's here's a question for you, Cyril. Uh, could you explain a little bit more briefly about a resilient connectivity service? Yes, hard in 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, this embedded uh, uh, smart SIM applet uh, is a decision engine which uh, mixes and matches, uh, one, the potential visited networks it has in visibility. So it multiplexes the capacity to access to networks A, B, C, D, E at a given point of time and space. And also it multiplexes the backend routes to reach these, uh, these networks. What does that mean? Is that we have, we rely on, uh, several GRXs, several eventually, uh, transport backend, backend routes and the applet will make the best of all of these combinations to uh, dynamically make sure it at all times has a route. So visited network and backend route to ensure it has a connection and it has the best possible connection. So it's a, both selecting visited network and backend routes to sum it up to, uh, to maximize the uptime rate and the quality of service produced. Okay, uh, and thank you. That was well done in a very short space of time. Um, a question, this one's for, definitely for you, Cyril. What parameters are used for smart SIM network selection decision-making? Um, the questioner suggests power levels, quality of service, charging rates, and what entity provides that data. Okay, uh, again, hard in 30 seconds. 
it, the, uh, in theory, the algorithm and the, uh, the decision engine could rely on, on many different uh, KPIs, criteria, and we can even uh, multiplex and superpose, superpose these, uh, these KPIs. In, in real life, we've uh, come up to a conclusion that we need to, uh, there's, there's a certain number of key criteria like uh, um, GPS attachment, uh, um, PDP context uh, uh, criteria. We can also play on the RSSI level, obviously. The, our observation is that we, we, we need to find the right uh, KPIs and the right uh, triggers for these KPIs. Otherwise, in, especially for moving objects, we can end up in, in a kind of hysteresis behavior where the benefits are are lower than the uh, the, the downsides. So we we can play we theoretically play on our RSSI, um, uh, GPS attachment, even latency, even if, even a potentially throughput criteria. In real life, for most of our customers with data centric applications, it it it, it uh, uh, boils down to GPS attachment and and eventually uh, another criteria. But but it, it, it's something we we can potentially tweak depending on the business and operational logic of our customers. Okay, um, it, there's quite a broad question here for Ricard, uh, but one that um, gets across the whole of the fleet telematics picture. Um, again, if you can be uh, as brief as you can, Ricard, how have fleet telematics players changed the way they charge for solutions? Uh, let's see. Okay, if we go back to the early days, uh, a fleet owner would buy quite expensive telematics hardware up front and uh, connect it to a software packet that would oftentimes be hosted in-house on company servers. Uh, since then, there has in general been a transition from the client server software licenses paid up front more to like SaaS-based models based on recurring fees, uh, well, just like for many other software-driven markets. And today, it's even increasingly common for providers to bundle all costs, including not only the software and services, but also the hardware and the necessary connectivity, which may include roaming, into one recurring fee. Uh, so to summarize, it's quite similar to the developments seen in many other markets where SaaS models have taken over. That, that's my 30-second take on things. I <laughs> hope that's helpful. It's very helpful and amazing to get that all into 30 seconds. Um, this will have to be the last question, I'm afraid, otherwise somebody's going to um, have it in for me. Uh, I'm, this is for you, Cyril. Um, I think you may have touched on this, but if, if there's still any doubt out there, I think it's important we nail this. Um, the smart SIM is carrier agnostic, but is it also hardware agnostic? Yes, yes. Uh, oh, yeah, very important. It is uh, hardware agnostic. We actually, we deploy uh, we deploy our SIMs probably uh, uh, a relatively small percentage of our deployments are on Tierra hardware. Our customers deploy with uh, any third-party vendor in terms of hardware, and it is car carrier agnostic. We this is why we propose today we have about 850, I don't know, I say 820 roaming agreements across the globe, and we provide unbiased access to those operators. The the decision engine on the SIM is only driven by QS criteria. So this is very important, and it's very, very different from the, 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 the behavior of traditional roaming teams. Yeah. Well, I, I, we could go on for a lot longer, but I'm very conscious that I'm intruding on the time of all of our delegates, and I'm, uh, as you are, I'm sure, amongst our speakers, very grateful for everyone's time. Um, so we'll have to wrap it up there for today. Um, as you'll be aware, you know, our intention has been to try and explain some of the options that are open to you for uh, a variety of different transport IoT projects. Um, if you want to see this again um, and get more detail and pause it and have a look at it in your own time, this uh, webinar will be available on our website from tomorrow. So don't forget to bookmark our website, and that is at iot-now.com. And there you'll also find the latest news, interviews, blogs, and videos. And you can stream the webinar from tomorrow. It just remains for me to say a huge thank you to our speakers. Um, Rickard Anderson of Berg Insight. Thank you, Rickard. Thank you. It's been great to have you here. And as always, thank you to Cyril of Sierra Wireless. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Most of all, ladies and gentlemen, I really want to thank you for joining us. Keep safe.
and we certainly do appreciate the time you've spent with us. From everyone here at IoT Now, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.